man. <laughs> Go. Hello and welcome to tonight's event with 192 Books. I am Evan, the manager here at 192, and I'm so thrilled to be presenting tonight's event with Wayne Kosselbaum and Guy Madden. Uh, presented by us, 192 Books, in the Paula Cooper Gallery. Um, today we are celebrating Wayne's, Wayne Cosmo's new book, The Cheerful Scapegoat, that came out today from Semiotex Press. Um, this is a really incredible book. It's a first collection of short fiction from Wayne. Um, if you don't already know, Wayne Cosmo is a poet, critic, artist, performer, the author of a ton of great books, including Figure It Out, Camp Marmalade, My 1980s, um, too many great ones to list. I've got a, a bunch behind me. Um, he's the recipient of an American Academy of Arts and Letters Award in Literature just last year, and he's a professor at the City University of the New York Graduate Center. Um, this, as I said before, is his first collection of work fiction, and it's a group of fables that sort of subvert every expectation you could have. Uh, plot, language, reality itself are, are constantly upended. Um, and tonight's event feels really this and, and special to me because if you <laughs> Remember, a little less than a year ago, Wayne was our first guest on these virtual events uh, during kind of the height of the pandemic. And it was, to put it lightly, a very different time, a very strange time. Um, he was talking about his book, Figure It Out, uh, essays. And I remember being so heartened and, and sort of filled with joy at the end of that event that <laughs> literature still had this possibility to make us feel good, even in times that were so different and so sort of murky and... and I don't want to say hopeless, but it was May 2020, it was just a weird time. And I just remember the, the sense of happiness. So it feels really nice now to be back with Wayne in a time when uh, good times are coming around the corner. I mean, more people are getting vaccinated and it seems like uh, something close to normal is back in sight. And that sort of hopeful feeling is something that I kind of get when I read Wayne's work, um, especially in this collection, just the sense that something unexpected and great is coming just around the corner. Um, it's <laughs> such a nice feeling to get um, in a book and not something you get really often. Um, and I also am really excited to be joined uh, tonight by Guy Madden, who's the incredible director of such films as Forbidden Room, Status Music in the World, and uh, one of my personal favorites, My Winnipeg. Um, Guy Madden's work, I think, has the same sort of bristling relationship to genre that Wayne's does, it's, it's constantly moving between different modes and, and stopping itself and focusing on minutia and then expanding to, to fit in the universal. And if you haven't seen those films or any of guys' films, I really highly recommend checking them out. And I think we have a great synchronicity between our guests tonight in the, the way that they like to work. Um, they both make things experimental without uh, making things into a slog. You know, they, they keep things light and playful. And, um, it's just such a pleasure to even be a witness to this tonight. So enough of my <laughs> pay on for both of them. Um, we're gonna hear a nice reading just from Wayne's new book. And then Wayne and Guy are gonna talk about anything and everything they want, um, this new book and sort of um, their shared connection and you know anything. <laughs> I think it's gonna take some really surprising turns. Um, then at the end of that discussion, we're gonna take questions from you, the audience. Um, you can send those to me at the email below. It's evan at 192books.com. Uh, I will relay that to them. So if you have a question and you wanna hear it answered, the earlier you ask, the better chance you'll hear it. So send them early and often. You can send them right now if you want. Um, so that is about all I have. Now, without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Wayne Kostenbaum. Enjoy everyone. Thank you, Evan. I'm gonna put myself on gallery view so I see you and I see Guy and I feel like I'm with the threesome. Evan, I just visited in person a block away at 192 Books and it feels so great to be virtually, sadly not in person, but still virtually doing this event with my favorite bookstore in the world, 192 Books and an honor a pleasure, a transgression, a delight to be speaking in public with the great Guy Madden, whom I've worshipped for years, lush, yes, Guy, it's the truth, and who is is a cinema poet of the highest 
order, one of the, the true cinema poets in the history of the medium. And we sh I do think we share a lot of themes and methods in common as well as I think a sense of how to pursue our idiosyncra idiosyncratic mission apart from the usual paths. And I wanna thank, before I start reading my st a story, I wanna also thank Hedy L. Colty, the, one of the editors um, at Semiotex Books, a, a legendary publisher famed for its transgressions, for its politics, and also for its straddling of the line between uh, life and art and making us very confused about which realm we're in. And Hetty was just a dream editor of this book and I'm so proud and, and thrilled that it came out with him. So thank you. So the story I'm gonna read, which takes three minutes, it's one paragraph. It's called Mayoral Chandelier. The chandelier in the mayor's dining room was insufficiently mayoral, an insufficiency that displeased the mayor's father who had bestowed upon his only son this gilded chandelier as a symbol of the civic crotch that the son must now nurse to maturity. The chandelier had no say in the matter. The chandelier, more bisexual than most lamp fixtures, cared for neither civics nor degeneration. Degeneration would be the fate of the civic crotch if the indifferent chandelier did not step up to bat by mitigating its own brilliancy, by deciding to grow dim at accustomed hours, and by desiring the civic crotch, and thus preventing the mayor from pox. Pox awaited the mayor if his father didn't rise from narcoleptic coma and aid the chandelier in limiting its illumination. In this dining room, before coma had incapacitated the mayor's father, the two would often sit over postprandial cordials and bash the populace through slur and banter. I was sometimes present at these colloquies under the watchful light of a chandelier whose function the apothecary and the plumber had grown to doubt. I never doubted the chandelier. I was its staunch defender, its medicator. I applied grease and toothpick to the crevices within the chandelier's unseen foundations, where the chandelier ceased to be merely, a sh ceased to be entirely a chandelier and began to resemble a grotto within Paris's honeycombed sewers. Because my affair with the mayor's father had offended the newspaper's editorial staff, I had no choice but to lubricate the chandelier and to sit on lucky evenings with a mayoral pair a fils to contemplate the wreckage of the town asleep around us, a town already so afflicted with caries and rot that soon we would have no cabinet, no police, no mansion and no chandelier. Meanwhile, the mayor wrote his speeches under the glaucous pools of light the chandelier sent downward in its quest to be an ambassador of civility. Nine limbs had the chandelier. The mayor and I would soon bury the father, burn his papers, and try to forget the red boat he long ago rode on the village's lake. A lithograph of this boat sold last night at Sotheby's. After the sale, the victorious purchaser celebrated her triumph at a tapas bar where the portions were criminally meager. That's not a tapas bar that you or I, Guy, are going to go to. Oh my God, Wayne. I just love, 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 love this book. I want to get that off my chest right away. It's, it's just a culmination of everything I love about language. And I don't know, it's uh, I, I, like what you do with words and um, just 
I, I remember when I, I didn't start reading until I was, I was, I was mentioning to you earlier that I got uh, flunked out of 12th grade English because I wasn't a reader, but I, I started reading as an adult. And I guess the first uh, author I read was Nabokov. And I was always amazed that by the end of each sentence, it seemed like he wouldn't be able to pull it off, that he wouldn't be able to land cleanly, but he invariably did and spectacularly, but yours, you're just, you're getting an 11 out of 10 at the, uh, at the Olympics. Um, you know, you're really landing your routines here. It's, I, I, I don't want to, I've got to stay away from sports metaphors, but um, you have, you have pleasured me. The, um, <laughs> it's, it's, there's just, the idea of these things being fables is just so amazing. Um, they don't really remind me of anything they want. I want them to remind me of something, but they really are sui generis items. The closest thing I've come to are maybe um, the strange feelings I get from reading Juna Barnes interviews, where both she and her interview subjects speak in exactly the same surprising turns, and you wonder why, what's going on there. Um, maybe hebdomeros, uh, de Chirico's hebdomeros, but concentrated into a, a page <laughs> somehow. Um, I just really love it. And I love it in 3D. I'll explain what that, what I mean by that. I have this sort of pleasure heightening practice I do, especially when watching the Mission Impossible movies. I pretend Luis Buñuel is sitting beside me and I watch the movie through, you know, through the parallax view of him as well as my own view. And it just heightens everything in the films because the films exist, it seems only for their own sake. And they're so well put together, but only Luis Bunuel could fully appreciate that somehow. And I, and on, on planes, uh, Bunuel doesn't sit next to me. I refuse to watch movies with headphones. And that's when, uh, F.W. Murnau, who made silent films frequently with very few intertitles, um, he joins me and we will watch uh, a movie that I've made silent by refusing to listen. And I once had a very sublime experience watching Kate Bosworth in uh, a surfing movie called Blue Crush. And the camera work was just something that F.W. Murnau would have killed for. About partway into your book, wherever a uh, terrifying typo appears, Robert Walser nuzzled up beside me and I realized, I guess I could smell the bratwurst on, on his breath or something like that. And I realized he's, he's another great fable writer uh, without really writing fables. And there's a kind of, you know, a, a peripatetic meandering where you never know once he takes the first step on his stroll into a fable where he's going to end up, but the language is delightful. But you've just intensified that so much and just made it so much more beautiful, uh, made it coruscate, uh, to use a word we swapped uh, recently. Um, I, I'm, why am I giving a lecture to you, Wayne? This is ridiculous. This is the, I mean, this isn't a lecture, it's a eulogy, except I'm alive. Or, <laughs> I'm, no, I just got an award. I got the, I got the Winnipeg um, <laughs> Lifetime Achievement Award. And it's and the award ceremony will be in the rink or in the, wherever <laughs> hockey is. You know, play. about sports, when you had the sports metaphor, I it wasn't really a sport because the funny thing about your use of sports is how much it, uh, whatever macho hijinks may take place often in sports, they're flattened in your case by comedy, collecting, obsolescence. Yeah impersonation um, and a kind of, you know, 2D process as the opposite of 3D where, where, the, where the figures turn into the playing cards of the figure. Right. Yeah, it was, I guess my childhood was a strange one and, you know, I, I just never even begun to consider growing up. I should be ashamed and I'm sorry about this, but I've just finally figured that out about myself. And I've, I've, just had my own personal mythology burnt into my head by the earliest smells and sensations. And I grew up um, on the, this is kind of binary. 
but on my mother's side in the uh, beauty salon that my mom and her sister ran and out of our house was huge and for Iceland, elderly Icelandic Canadian uh, clients only. And then on my father's side over at the Winnipeg Arena where I was the stick boy for the Winnipeg Maroons and the Canadian national hockey team. And, and I was just in there with the, and the smells of those two realms and the nudity and the guards let down uh, in, in um, both the genders of this binary upbringing. Um, uh, were, they're just so lascivious and illicit. And um, I just, I wasn't supposed to stray into the player's shower area, but how can you not? You know, when the, the players who are your idols, who are skating around and scoring goals against the Ruskies and the Czechs and the Swedes, uh, one minute we're lathering up in the steamy showers the next. How are you supposed to just keep to your spot um, sorting out rolls of tape and things like that? And when you're in the, in the beauty salon, how are you supposed to not crawl up the hair chute where all the floor sweepings are swept and peer at the stockinged legs of all the women lined up beneath the roaring hair dryers? How are you just... How are you supposed to not do that? You know, I, I, so all this stuff is loaded, but then for some reason, um, I needed to mythologize everything. To experience it is one thing, but to mythologize it is another. And, and I sensed early on that the medium of mythology for me anyway, as a baby boomer, you're, you're one too, I guess, but was film emulsion. And it, it seemed to me that representations of these two worlds uh, were sorely lacking in film and television. Hockey dressing rooms and beauty salons just didn't show up very often. So uh, what I could find was always very two-dimensional facsimiles, hockey playing cards, maybe um, some snowy television broadcasts. Really, um, film was so slow in those days that when, um, when a hockey game was photographed, it was like a film noir. And there was just a kind of a, a woeful feebleness to the way everything was represented. And that's what I grew to, to love. Um, but anyway, that's me. <laughs> well, I would take the, the point that I would love to, there's so much I would love to say, including the salience and um, ir, the indelibility of childhood memory, but even to say childhood memory is to cast a kind of Freudian eye on it rather than the, the emulsive eye in a way that, that you and, and I hope I through language cast where it's the glow of the memory and it's staying power, not in a sense what it symbolizes. So it's the, it's the a, a kind of tactile, however decaying fact of those emblems. And nudity, I just want to touch on nudity because it's a, uh, uh, George, there's, okay, John Waters, George Kuchar, Andy Warhol, there's, you know, independent cinemas filled with nudity, but also mainstream cinemas filled with nudity. And, and maybe this is banal, but I really do think that our relationship to gratuitous, in a way, asexual nudity, not, it didn't begin as asexual, but it got erased by the emulsive eye. In some sense, it, it, it was struck by patina and it and it lost its um, turgidity or something. And so we have this the sense that there's suddenly a breast or there's suddenly your movies. There's just all this pendency of phallus, gratuitous pendency of phallus that doesn't. It, it, it it's it's just the fancy word would be to say in a way that it's non-signifying. It doesn't lead us into the uh, the gutter of sexuality or the prison. Of it and oh. it just I just love I guess I noticed and the, the parts of my work that I always like the best are the nude parts and I like to put like in terms of Nabokov and surprise I like nudity to be sudden yeah and um saturated with with nearby elements like velvet velvet pillow velvet pillow near breast not breast alone but velvet pillow near breast Right. I, it's funny, I never thought of its suddenness as something. Thanks for observing that. But there is a, a special pleasure one gets from a, a cut 
that just happens suddenly and seemingly without reason. My favorite one in all of cinema is one in Ed Wood's Glen or Glenda where Wood cuts inexplicably to a radiator and then, and then back to um, uh, a dying person, uh, away from the dying person to the radiator and then back. I, but the suddenness of, of gratuitous nudity is, is a thrill. And I'm wondering if I'm trying to replicate the sudden good fortune I experienced as, as a kid or as a creepy kid. I like to think I've cleaned up some of my creepiness, but I don't want to disappoint you. I'm still plenty creepy. Um, I, um, but I, there is a, there's a thrill of the sudden, the sudden giving of, of this stuff. And, I, but I, I don't know how horny the whole thing is. It's, it's just, it's a thrill, the kind of thrill an edit produces somehow. And, and I like to think of your words as emulsions because let's face it, I, I won't say that film is the mythologizing medium um, of the 20th century, it's certainly one of the most popular, but when just reading your words, they're as fine grained as emulsion and, and, and images really are recorded there and sensations and in, in ways that it's funny, I, I wasn't thinking of, of dream logic so much while reading the, the book and then suddenly I just decided to throw a toggle switch and retroactively regard the book as dreamlike and it really kicked in for me. Uh, there's just um, a combination, the collisions of words just the way you collide, you're the, you know, you're the large hadron collider, you know, I just love the way, you know, I, I, I hate to talk about uh, myself by way of talking about you, but uh, it's, it's funny how to think, uh, my first few movies were in black and white, but I was under a lot of pressure to make them in color so that maybe, so, maybe I could get a distribution deal or something ridiculous like that, it never worked, but, um, I, I, my way into thinking about color was through words. I was a house painter for the longest time and I was kind of mesmerized by those paint chip books and the names that various off-whites had. They're all just beige, <laughs> but they had such strange names. And I had to give a lecture once to earn a few bucks at the Bell Lightbox Theater in Toronto on this magnificent Douglas Sirk Technicolor movie. Uh, magnificent obsession. And I noticed when Rock Hudson is, is scrubbing up to perform brain surgery on Jane Wyman, that there's so many off-whites. The scene is almost entirely off a variety of off-whites. And I tried with my paint chip book, which is from the late 70s, early 80s, to identify the names of them. And they had such great names. And, it, and I realized that color is just words. They had names like Admiral's Mustache or, you know, Eisenhower or, you know, Front Tooth and Wonder Bread or, um, uh, I don't know, they, these little pairings that often went well together in the Douglas Sirk movie just remind me so much of what you do with language. You just arrange verbal um, palettes, little pairs, um, groin, Groin habits and uh, ocular melan melancholies or whatever is, a, I think, a phrase you use. Some, maybe is, is that in the, um, um, the dubious patio, newspaper on a dubious patio or whatever. So um, I, I don't know. This stuff just gets airborne in a, in a hurry for me and, and goes 3D. I don't need Robert Walser sitting next to me. He's always welcome. But this stuff gets, gets 3D for me. I want this. So I want... I want you sitting next to me and right, right with us. It'll be a, a folie <laughs> a trois, will be Agnes Moorhead. I used to dine out, I think, on my impression of Agnes Moorhead doing her scrub up in Magnificent Obsession. Because if, you know, I mean, there are no words for her, for the hyg hygienic fierceness of La Moorhead when she gets down to it. When, and it, it really is a kind of Tourette's dance of, of hygiene frenzy, but she's doing it. I mean, th there's a whole thing to be said about, um, the, about the Agnes Moorheads of the world who have a real place in your movies. And th th about in terms of like movies and the 20th century and the, myth the mythologizing of the 20th century and, and color words and things like that. I, I was, and the word ocular, it was striking me when you, 
groin habits and ocular melancholies, if that's the phrase, or maybe I said ocular habits and groin. Mel but for me, I guess the thing with diction that I do, I'm aware now of what I'm doing, which gives a kind of excessive pleasure, even if it sends me toward the antique and the undistributable, in a way it's my black and white, is to say ocular instead of visual. I right. like ocular because of the O's. There's a lot of reasons to like ocular better, not because it's more general or pretentious, pretentious only in the way that, um, I don't know whoever played the like kind of gay coded butler in 1930s movies, what, pretentious like that, pretentious like Catherine Hepburn, but ocular or like groin, Anytime you say groin, you don't, you're already, you're, you're surfing in language and in a very particular kind of 2D trading card version <laughs> of things where they're like what you're talking about, the various kinds of white, where there is a proliferation of chromatic varieties. And I like when I write to hang out, in, when I revise in the interstices of a word by going to the OED or to a dictionary in, in Ulipian style, skating around the word that I had originally meant and finding a weirder word near it. Absolutely. It's, it's strange. I'm glad you mentioned um, the Ulipian. Uh, there's something, um, well, there's, some, there's something I think about. I think about the Ulipo artists all the time and their restrictions and the game playing and um, what a thrill it was for me. I met Harry Matthews who showed up to watch um, John Ashbery narrate one of my movies once and I was, I just could not believe it. And, um, but the, uh, and then I read recently in the London Review of Books that Matthews himself was wary, too much game playing and dilettantism, but um, in, in setting up the Ulipo strictures, but his, his work is just so beautiful as well. But um, in your case and in mine, I just can't help it. The, in, um, the highly personal keeps cross-pollinating with the Ulipian game and whatever rules you set up for yourself, you, you seem to obey them just like a good little boy, but, um, but you slather yourself all over. Uh, the framework that uh, you've set up for yourself. And it's, uh, I really love that combination and I admire it and I wish, you know, I wish I could pull it off more, uh, uh, more often myself, but I'll, I'll keep trying. Um, where, you know, in, in some of my uh, movies, now that especially I'm make, making them with my partners, um, Evan and Galen Johnson, they, they're uh, real Russellians and um, uh, just they, um, especially documents to serve as an outline, um, the, the, which I think, I, I can't remember if Ashbury translated that, um, that piece of work, but it's, it's just so inspiring, the stories within stories within stories within stories. And um, we tried to model that, um, uh, we tried to borrow that model for the Forbidden Room structure, but then realized we were risking just making a long movie about precision, the I'll talk about precision, your sentences, but I'm not a precise person myself, but I was able to get some personal stuff in there, dreams, phobias, traumas, um, things, whether, even if no one cares about them, at least I knew they were there and that, that felt good. So I slathered in my own way. It's not as pretty when I slather as when you do, but, um, and I've never been a meticulous person, so it's a real slathering, but, um, you slather very beautifully. It's cream. It's like it's the kind of um, uh, the soapy bubbling of the, and particularly in your black and white films and the ba the bathing. Let's just say that like you know how to take a bath can be pushed backward over your entire over and seen as like that the 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 man uh, gesturing nude in his like you know bathrobe or whatever teaching us the pleasure the lubricious pleasures of the bath um, sends its spumy foam over all your black and white work and the fog and the riding on a train and the, the you know, everything whited out, that there's a sense of deep consolation and engulfment. But I wanted to say something about personal, how we both um, fasten on 
childhood or personal, indelible personal memories, be they traumatic or titillating or both at the same time, is by being emulsive formalists. And I don't know if you would call yourself a formalist, and I wouldn't really call myself a formalist either because I'm too unsystematic and not sloppy, but um, improvisational and sequential in my thinking rather than organizing it all from the beginning. But by being all, in, but by being in love with the interruptions of, that happen on the surface of the artwork, we can spend as long as we want in the dream world below, which is the dream world of hair salons, showers, furtive glimpses, early humiliations, uh, you know, like even just the way a face can loom up at you. I mean, I feel like in a lot of your films, actually that you capture the child's point of view shot where adult faces are intrinsically um, horrifying and lurid because of their largeness. They always seem to be cackling like Geraldine Chaplin, like in the forbidden room. I guess I, when I read, um, I think it was in John Cheever's journals about that great generation of, of, of Americans that woke, woke themselves up with uh, coughs every morning or whatever, and, and, chat, and, and cackled over tinkling highball glasses or whatever. I think I, I was a child of that generation and it really did seem like as when I did fall asleep, those were the those were the, um, the you know, the um, actors of <laughs> that, that lurked in the uh, periphery of my uh, attempt at having dreams. So I do remember some of my earliest nightmares involving things that I guess I've shot in such a way. Um, when you just described a face looming up, I um, instantly remembered the earliest nightmare I've I had. It's not that interesting, but it does have a face looming up, lit from below, as if by one light. I never could figure out how to light with more than one light. <laughs> so um, things tend to look a little bit scary and sinister anyway. As soon as I get more lights out for that, you know, that Fred Astaire high key lighting, um, things just didn't have atmosphere and everyone had three noses and um, nose shadows. Um, so yeah, I, I'm still trying to figure it out. It seems like you're on the verge of getting it. I've always been an outsider and my mother always loomed pretty large. She was an incredible outsider artist. She never paid any attention to styles or fashions and yet she was a hairstylist. She was kind of did hair do's the way um, someone working on a Ford assembly line would do them. These sort of screw down these silvery helmets and then next it was kind of beautiful. And she would, even when I was in high school, like knit pants for me, you know, that I was expected to wear to school. And it was really humiliating. And I remember um, when I was a grown up, even, I bought a new pair of skates that made my feet bleed. They didn't fit well enough. And instead of returning them or getting a pair that fit better, um, I just decided to try to play through. And my my skates filled with blood and my mother could smell the blood or just sense the blood across town. I wasn't living at home or anything. And she bought me um, a, a large a box of maxi pads, uh, Kotex maxi pads, which I was supposed to hockey tape to my feet to absorb the blood. And sure enough, this homemade remedy um, was perfect. My feet fit into the skates, um, the maxi pads filled with uh, blood because uh, my feet were just bleeding members and uh but by the end of the season of this three month outdoor season in winnipeg um i was down to some some light irregular spotting and um my mom knew best and then the next season it was just a matter of laying in a big you know three month supply of maxi pads and it could go but she could she, she could always sense when my sister or my brother or i were thinking of something uh, of the groin. And even if it was of the feet and, um, and she was on it, you know? And so this stuff works its way into the movies. Um, you know, who would look at a son's feet and think of feminine hygiene?
you know, my mom, you know, so. And we, and we would, and I, the, the, what's coming to mind about this, you, the maxi pads is first of all, is the tone, the tone of your story and the, the, the plucky resourceful sense that, that gender blur and humiliation and bleeding and amputation, which your movies are filled with. And that, that, that the word cheerful in my title, the cheerful scapegoat describes, I think for me half consciously, cause I don't know if I intended it when I wrote the book, an attitude to take toward the bleeding foot, as it were. If let's say that the foot, you know, thinking of Ronald Furbank, who's part of this canon with Juna Barnes, I think of impossible fiction writers who shouldn't be writing fiction, of the, the flower beneath the foot, that the foot is not ble bleeding just because the shoes are too tight, but because it has been stepped on in some way. It, it's, a, it's a persecuted foot in a way. And so if the foot, the attitude toward the bleeding foot though, is to be proud of one's housecraft and cheerful about possible amelioration, not because you have an optimistic um, theory of history or something. It's not a theory of history. It's a simply a kind of no nonsense. The tone is like John Ashbery's practical voice in his yeah. work. And it's your practical voice too, the way you would have in a title. I think in one of your movies, maybe it's cowards bend the knee, like fisting like all of a sudden like fisting and you're enjoying as I do too, that you can have a, a cheerful relation to hot scenes, to uh, damaged organs. Um, yeah, I, 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 yeah, I, Laura, we were gonna, we, Laura Riding would need to be mentioned partly because she's obviously in the saddest music in the world, uh, The the main character is a Laura Riding character, but that the tone of Laura Riding's progress of stories was so important to me along with Robert Falser when yeah. I wrote mine and that, that her attitude toward circumstance and happenstance is, I don't know if, if you have thoughts on that or if you just go somewhere else with it, but I wanted to just bring up Laura Riding and that attitude toward the inconsequence of daily life. Like the things do not follow. I. I read Progress of Stories quite a while ago, maybe, maybe it was um, Michael Silverblatt, Radio's Bookworm, who suggested I read it and I, I was absolutely delighted and frustrated and confounded and all sorts of things because I think I expected it to be one thing, but by the time it settled within me, it just would not go away. And then uh, re more recently, Experts Are Puzzled came out anyway just her constant acknowledgement of the act of writing. You know, I guess a lot of writers do this, but there's something in the way she does it and then the way you do it. I'm pleased to hear that uh, the progress of stories was important to you. Um, there's, there's just so much play and in her case, a little less cheerfulness, maybe a little more crustiness, uh, but, but it's still wonderful. Um, the stories start to shape up as stories and then she takes them on a detour into um, uh, an inspection of what a story even is and then uh, she might even just dismiss everything uh, with um, a, a beautiful verbal gesture and then start all over again somehow and you really once once you just um, you know have fastened your seatbelt for the for the ride it's it's really pleasurable. I, I, I can't really put my, my finger on it other than that I can recommend. Any, anyone who likes Wayne should, should take a, a good glorious run at Laura Riding, Progress of Stories. But I was so happy in the, the saddest music in the world to know that there she, there a reference appeared and it becomes a kind of sign of blessing. <laughs> Again, over many of the work that, that one's attitude toward voyage and travel, because I think the crankiness for Laura Riding comes not just from her stern philosophic bent and maybe just a general crankiness period, but, but from uh, a sense that by f stepping back, disenchanted from the act of making, right? The act of writing in this case, you can offer yourself more 
exit visas to go to other strange places right away. Yeah, right you, away. And, and you and she have a, a really good es escape velocity. Uh, you, you know, halfway through a sentence, you're, um, or- Why wait time. even that, why, at the, yeah. con we're off, our bags are always packed. As, yeah, 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 fisty, yeah, <laughs> just a sudden fisty. Um, I, there was one moment I wanted to ask you about in the, the very beginning of the Forbidden Room. And it's, it's a kind of thing that happens a lot in, in your work, but it's, it's something I feel is a point of analogy between us, but it's also just a thing I love. It's during the title sequence, it, you, there's not a second that you let the title just be there saying, you know, like hair by whomever. The color changes, it jumps up. The, bl the degree of blur changes. There's this, you know, absolutely beyond cheerful, jouissance, saturated <laughs> level of tampering. Like I'm going to tamper. It's the exit ramp thing or the exit visa. I'm going to. I'm telling you who did the hair, and I'm going to use this as a Ouija board chance to to jam and and spin as far away as possible from explanation and helpfulness. Yeah, I. I'm really pleased with how those titles turned out. In the past, before I started working with my collaborators, my titles were always pretty bare bones. Um, but this was a project about lost film and um, all the stories within it nested um, sort of uh, in Roussellian-like fashion were our adaptations of movies that once were and have since been lost. And so, um, and the movies shot on film emulsion that is so fragile and so uh, over baked and aged and, um, and, and buckling and bubbling and roiling um, and just seeming on the verge of just turning into powder in the projection, the projectionists booth um, that we needed some credits that reflected this and um, one of my co-directors, uh, Galen Johnson, is also an excellent graphic designer, and he he just designed, he did the music and the and all the fonts and the timing and everything for the credits, and I, I really think they were on point. So I I just signed off on them, but with major goosebumps because um, he very smartly hit all the th the themes that. Um, you don't expect credits to get except in like James Bond credits or something like that, where a theme might be, you know, scuba diving or something like that. But this one really, um, really pleased me. And uh, I'm, I'm, it really, yeah, they really don't stick around long. They disappear, uh, just like the movies themselves seem to be threatening to do um, within that movie. Um, so and, Go on. No, go on. no, no, I, I think I, I think I, I think I need an escape from that sentence. I, I don't have anything more to say. <laughs> yeah, it, it, what, it rem what, what that quick, uh, pleasurable oscillation away from a legible title seems to me to read to, to reminds me of is a something that is throughout your work as a guiding light. I think is the the. the permission given to stop in the stop instantly in the midst of a wrong turn and move somewhere else. And I, I think that for me in writing The Cheerful Scapegoat more than any other book of mine, I was giving myself the opportunity to put a sentence down and as the sentence started to be not the sentence I wanted to live with, Move, move away within the sentence as quickly as possible. So it became a writing method, not of draft after draft after draft where I gradually found my tone, but each sentence being a step on the way toward finding the yeah. tone, even if I never find. So it's just, it's almost like a timed performance. You have 20 minutes to reach the end, start anywhere. But the second you don't like what's happening, announce that you don't like it, and make a sharp turn. And it's, I think it's that, um, I think of it as the freedom to interrupt oneself and the freedom yeah. to drop the goods in the middle of delivering them. I read, um, I think she's Canadian, Lisa Robertson wrote about your sentences that each 
one has a fabulous mouth feel. And I really like that comment because there is something, there's a number of textures going on in there. It's like um, this new pasta I've heard about. Someone's designed a new pasta that's meant to be tactile in about seven different ways and hold sauce in different ways or something like that. But your sentences do have a mouth feel to them and you really want to read them out loud uh, and take your time with them. And it was a pleasure to hear you read yours. I was half hoping to just pick up your book and start reading, but I realized, no, I need to, I need to um, uh, not read your writing out loud. But, um, but I, I, I'm just going to, after dinner tonight, um, mouth feel my way through um, a few extra chapters. But it's the permission you've given yourself isn't it just if someone listening to this hadn't read any of you before, uh, they might fear that they're just getting a bag of broken glass shards or something like that that look pretty but are hard to digest. But it's really gorgeous and it makes so much sense along the way and your leaps are always the right size even the astonishingly huge ones and your u-turns and i don't know there's probably a pasta metaphor in there somewhere but uh, i'll leave it I'll, I'll just escape again i know maybe it's i'm thinking of i'm thinking of your wonderful film dracula pages from a virgin's diary which is i feel like your most operatic because it's it really is a dance film and it 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 seems to depict not the pratfall, the amputated pratfall away from the normal workaday common sense world, but an elevation through mouthfeel. If the vampire, the vampire's kiss has quite a mouthfeel, an elevation into pure dance. And it's a very romantic movie. And it's I bring it up because I think that what we have in common is not sentimentality, but heartbrokenness in some basic way. We don't have the monopoly on it. There's not a living person who is not in some way at one point or another heartbroken. But there are ways that we, do, and I think Ashbury as well, and other figures that we revere in common or separately, that, that find a, a, a way to deal with sentimentality or the sentimental, partly through surrealism, partly through uh, a staging of verbal and cinematic error, interrupt, you know, like messing yeah. it up visibly in a way that deflates it, but find a way to be really quite uh, nakedly emotional in the way that opera and, and classic yeah. dance are. I've, um... Well, that was, of course, my way into you way back with the Queen's Throat and um, just identifying with all those feelings produced in what um, I think I just instantly took over what you were writing as a reader and just put myself in there as a, as a, as a lonely boy, lots of self-pity, but exquisitely romanticized operatically romanticized yearning and longing and um, with just the right amount of self-pity and then all that pragmatism that um, my mother could supply. But it all just amounted to a wanting to devour opera without even knowing where to begin or whatever. Um, but I just found opera elsewhere if I had to. As a kid, I didn't listen to it at all. I listened instead to, um, up here in remote Winnipeg, I listened to very um, staticky AM radio broadcasts from other cities in America, and that was my opera. I figured, you know, uh, late night talk shows or baseball broadcasts or just commercials uh, for um, businesses in Detroit or Houston or even as far away as um, um, Mexican border towns and things like that on cl clear nights. And that to me was produced the same feelings in me that, that you got um, in the queen's throat. And I couldn't believe the connection you made to me even then years before we ever met and um, across decades, across um, 
uh, tumescent, <laughs> you know, acres of tumescent members. Um, it just, uh, uh, yeah, there's something operatic there. I didn't want to make Dracula because I felt I would blow it and I felt the story had been done too many times, but I, I read the book, I, it was offered to me and I needed money, so I accepted the job. But the first thing I did was read the book and discover that it's about a bunch of other things that movie adaptations almost never touch upon. And so I just, and, and what it was about was um, um, male jealousy and uh, xenophobia and um, things um, we all experience at some tamped down level or not so tamped down. And, and I began to understand that the, the movie uh, or the movie could be actually about something and not just these ritualized um, bites and, and things. It could be about those too, but it, it could actually be about something. And, and so I started to try to steer it that way. And then I think all those things slipped out of my grasp anyway, because I'm only so good, but at least it set me off in a direction. And, um, and then the, the ballet and just however it happened to get shot because I'm a, I'm a sloppy filmmaker. It's interesting, you're unbelievably precise, but, um, but I understand when you say, you know, you're divagating, <laughs> um, uh, divagations are us or whatever. Um, and the, there's, there's a real strange pleasure and that's in Roussel as well, although it's not like yours, but uh, Roussel's is different, a little more, more on the side of precise, but just going place, going narrative places uh, and without any idea where this could possibly go. And the precision along the way is just jaw-droppingly miraculous. And then, and then there you are all of a sudden, or there you aren't, I don't know. <laughs> just, thank you for all of, thank you for all of that. I'll just say one more thing and then maybe it's question, question time. I believe so. That, um, what was I gonna say? There's just so much to say. So there really is a lot to say, Guy. Uh, but, we'll have to. I think we'll one to thing I do, I, I do want to say is there's nothing I think that is funnier than what you said originally about Juna Barnes, that, that, it's, that when characters speak exactly the same, and you and I don't speak exactly the same, but maybe we like Juna Barnes are doing it. The thing yeah. that, the thing I wanted to say was um, I can't even remember the thing I wanted to say. Like, it's just too much. It's too much, Guy, all the things I want to tell you. So I think we need questions. And the second the first person okay. at, asks a question, I am going to um, remember what I wanted to say to you so burningly. All right, we've got some great questions. And I feel like I'm shouldering my way through Walzer and Junior Barnes and take a seat at the table. Um, a couple of people have asked just, when did you uh, first cross paths, you two? I, I think it was around the time Wayne was promoting uh, humiliation. So, but that's 2011, Wayne. Is that when that was? Mm -hmm. I, I think um, a friend of mine had interviewed him and then gave me his email address, and I probably wrote him a a really gushy fan boy email, and then maybe we met up in New York or something like that. I just insisted on meeting him. I can't remember. It was fun, it was yeah. fun. I also, I remember though, of course, my trip to Winnipeg, where I think, um, where I forgot my passport, because I did, forgot that Canada was a different country and that I didn't need a passport and I had to go, I missed my flight. And you, with Noam and a couple of other people, were at the air, even though, because of my utter uh, sectarian foolishness and my forgotten passport, we were supposed to have dinner at this place that you loved at eight o'clock. We had dinner there at midnight because I forgot my passport. <laughs> so that, that, you know, that, that began everything. Yeah, the, the Winnipeg's restaurants will stay open for. I still have the pen. Oh God, I think I still have the pen. Is it red? Is it, it's yes. from Ray Oh and my Jerry. God, Ray and Jerry's, Ray, Ray and Jerry's. world, world. I have the pen I got that night, Ray and Jerry's. It's a fantastic steakhouse here in Winnipeg. Yeah, I, I recommend it to all of those out there in streaming land, visiting, planning on visiting Winnipeg when the borders melt away. 
1405 Portage Avenue, 775-8154. Call them now. <laughs> um, another question is, uh, if you had any writers while you were putting together this collection that you felt particularly guided you, or um, if you have a specific favorite short story writer, I know that's kind of choosing your darlings, but. Uh. I mean, when I was young, when I started writing fiction in college, Joyce Carol Oates, Flannery O'Connor, D.H. Lawrence, you know, others too, but those, those were big ones. But for this book, and even thinking, since I'm not, my metier is hardly a fiction writers, and I really, telling us a pleasing story, a page turning story is not something that I can sadly do. Um, that I, but it was reading, it, uh, years and years of reading weird fiction, Ivy Compton Burnett, Robert Volster, which isn't even fiction, Laura Riding, uh, finding often at 192 books on the translation table, uh, books that came in the box of a novel, like you begin at the beginning and you end at the end and there's everything is made up in between, but where you really don't know where you're going. And it's a, there's a sort of churlish host who might be serving for might be serving anchovies as the main course. <laughs> um, so we got another one here. Um, love how you talk about ice skating around words and hanging out with them. And they wonder if you feel a similar sense of play with your visual art um, or your diary process or uh, how those processes differ or are similar for you. Well, I'm, you know, I am right now steeped in making very amateur videos. <clears throat> I say amateur because I don't, they really are amateurs, but I'm, I'm taking and, and watching your movies, Guy, re-watching them now that they're on the Criterion channel. For, for a time, there's like tons of them and you can really binge and re-see re -see them. As I'm, you know, falling in love with cinematic poems and understanding that, they're, it, that the pleasures of editing in cinematic art are exactly like the pleasures of editing and writing, which is, which is having um, as many opportunities of tactile resting. And I'm going like this, because you're just like, you can reach in and you, you do this thing and then you can put that thing next to it. And then you can add that thing on top of it. And then you cut it in half and then you send that one over there. And then you blur up that one. And then you make this part pink and then that's dull. So you stick a word on top of it. And then you, you know, you can, you can play with a stream of cinematic time in a way that, that feels to me as satisfying as writing. And in painting too, I, the, the pleasure of, procedures, doing something, changing my mind, doing another thing, moving through the, the narrative of the execution of a painting. I, I have to tell Guy though, and I have to tell the world if you care, <laughs> since you told us about your high school English experience and stuff like that and early, and your, your bleeding foot uh, is that when I was it, maybe in eighth grade, or even younger, I took an animation, super eight animation course in Los Gatos at the Montalvo Art Center one summer. And I made a little animation, stop motion animation film with, with cutouts. It was that kind of animation. The, the camera was stuck there and every Saturday I would go there and we would film another little bit. And the film I made, which was terrible, I think, I, <laughs> I, I made a little cutout doll of Mae West in one of her kind of Yukon outfits. And I had her like, kind of walk across some kind of Klondike landscape. And maybe there was a, maybe there were other people, but my drawing skills were not very good then. And I still, I just still remember how laborious it was to move Mae West bit by bit. That was really, I didn't really left filmmaking behind for a long time after that. You could still be working on it now. Um... The way you describe editing reminds me of 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 a, watching a child just at you know lost in concentration, but just making art. You know, a five year old just moving with so much confidence, putting a seashell there, a noodle there, the the the, the color. Um, I don't know. Some I, I'm um, losing a color. I wanted to use one of your one of your twelve dollar colors. 
was it Gomboge or something like that? Or, um, but the but, okay, sorry, go on. No, no, but just just that kind of um, because your films, the ones you post on Instagram, are are so short and gorgeous and concentrated and and really, um, you know, they feel loose and improvised. I know they're not, but uh, they have that spear that cheerful um, the cheerfulness theme of the night. Maybe one more, is there time for one more question? Yeah, we got one more. Um, so this person wants to know about the relationship between these new fables and, and your poetry and criticism and sort of how these fables engage with, and, and there are a lot of categories here so you can pick one or pick them all. <laughs> um, contemporary LGBTQIA American fiction, the history of cinema, uh, films, queer theory, hybrid literatures, um, the corpus of European global myths, or <laughs> just sort of the relation between your fables and your criticism and, and the poetry. Well, I love it. I would say I would love, I would be honored to be included in any of that. <laughs> I, I would say that I was thinking about the trajectory of my life and I often worry or wonder, I'd say, well, you know, words are the thing I probably do better than the other things I try to do. So why don't I just do that and get really good at it? <laughs> Then I, because today is the publication day of this book, and I'm very proud and happy of it. But I was, you know, always wondering, well, what if I had not done all the, what if I had never tried to paint? What if I had never taken piano lessons again and did my lounge act? What if I hadn't spent so long doing these other activities? Would I have written a better book or, an, or would it have been better? What's, is, the, you know, was it a mistake not to specialize? And then I remembered that of course I had begun life wanting to specialize in writing fiction and it felt that I was not good enough to do that. So I went and became a critic instead and a poet, but that the only reason these fables exist is because I know a lot of painters and artists and people and curators and, they, and these were all pretty much all written in response to requests by artists to write about their work or curators to write about a show that they had put together. And I would say to these people, I, I don't wanna write an essay, but would you mind a fable? And they would say, fine. And I'll say, I'll write like three or four and you can pick the ones that you like. And I built the book by, in a way with these kind of relational aesthetics-ish, building on the friendships I had with artists to create a space for me to write fables so that the space of fiction writing for me is nested within my embeddedness in art, visual art. Well, great. You have any final remarks? Any, you remember what you wanted to say? Maybe anything um, before I go into my spiel? <laughs> um, I want to thank Wayne for talking so much about me on this, on this incredible night for him. Uh, so thanks, Wayne, and a million congratulations to you on an astonishing masterpiece. Um, a coruscating one, and um, and thanks for being so generous. Thank you, Guy, for for appearing with me, and it's an utter pleasure to talk with you about your movies and about movies and poems and fables and how they all intermingle. It's it's all so beautiful. Um, come to Ray and Jerry's when the borders melt, and um, maybe soon. Yes, exactly. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you. Good night. Good night. All right. Thank you so much to Wayne Kostenbaum and Guy Madden for that wonderful, wonderful uh, <laughs> discussion. I mean, there's so many paths on that that I feel like uh, <laughs> I got lost in them for a second. But if you want to go back and watch something or, or watch a bit again, this recording will be available right after. Um, and in fact, all our past events are available to watch. So if you want to go back and watch Wayne's first event with us, you can. Everything from Wayne to Wayne now uh, is available on the Paula Cooper, uh, Paula Cooper Gallery Studio website that you're on right now. Just hit post and keep scrolling. You'll see everything. Um, we have got the book here in store. It's so great. Come down and get it. We're open for safe, socially distanced browsing every day from 11 to 5 until 6 on Fridays and Saturdays. Um, if you want to reserve a copy, just send us an email, info at 192books.com. We can also do a curbside pickup. If you don't want to come in, we can run the book out to you. Um, and if you can't make it, 
down to Chelsea, we've got direct shipping via bookshop. There's a link right below on this page. So just go there and they'll send it right to you. Um, our next event is Thursday at 6 p.m. Same place, Paul Cooper Gallery, uh, Paul Cooper Gallery Studio.com. We're going to be talking to David Thompson and Michael Barker on this new book, Light in the Dark, the History of Movie Directors. And then next week, we're going to be talking with uh, Andrea Bajani and Edmund White about If You Kept a Record of Sins. That's uh, next Tuesday at 6 p.m. here as well. So uh, I hope you enjoyed tonight. Hope to see you in the store sometime soon. And thank you everyone for joining us and have a wonderful night. Bye.